Hello, my name is Peter Orio. The title of today's talk is Socioeconomic Aspects of Prostate Brachytherapy. I'll talk about the socioeconomic influences on prostate brachytherapy, focusing on the financial considerations of the procedure. I'll also talk about the potential impact of the radiation oncology alternative payment model. So as we know, prostate brachytherapy are seeds or catheters within the prostate gland. It's a transperineal approach, which allows us to do either low dose rate or high dose rate brachytherapy. In my opinion, there are nine social economic factors negatively impacting prostate brachytherapy over the years. <clears throat> they include a decrease in PSA screening and prostate cancer diagnosis. If there's less men diagnosed with cancer, there are less treatments which are offered. There's also an increase in patients elective act electing active surveillance. This is good because many men with low risk prostate cancer do not require treatment. There's also the NRC regulatory requirements, which can be somewhat onerous, and they do defer, deter some individuals from studying brachytherapy programs. We also know there's an increase in the number of robotic prostatectomies. Many hospitals have introduced robotic technologies into their ORs, and as such, many patients are being treated with prostatectomy. Also too, robots are just simply sexy. We see also there's a suboptimal volume of prostate brachytherapy procedures. So a skill set may be being lost. There may be decreased training opportunities and residents may not be emerging proficient in prostate brachytherapy and may choose external beam technologies instead to treat their patients. And of course, it wasn't that many years ago we saw the negative press of bad prostate implants being performed at the Philadelphia VA. This wound up on the front page of the New York Times. It was a permanent record for all to see, because when we do prostate brachytherapy, we have a permanent record which was done. So you have to do it well. There's also increased technical sophistication of external beam radiation technologies, IMRT, SBRT, protons. And we realize there's competing academic research interests from many academic centers. And a lot has been focusing on hyperfractionation and different beam technologies. And so publications are now driving the way patients are being treated. There's a lack of knowledge of brachytherapies of efficacy. This is especially <clears throat> noticeable in the high risk setting when we know brachytherapy will definitely improve biochemical control in high risk disease. But to me, the greatest factor which negatively impacted prostate brachytherapy is decreased reimbursement rates, especially when it's compared to IMRT. We also know many urology owned centers focus on IMRT technologies. So we're going to talk a little bit about radiation oncology alternative payment models and why this may change how brachytherapy is viewed in the future. Now, if you ask me how patients are going to be treated, I always say, follow the money. The United States Government Accountability Office did. And in this report, they basically showed that if you had a self-referring self interest in a center that offered radiation, especially IMRT, it would increase by about 50%. Radical prostatectomies will be decreased by 27% and brachytherapy, which is the least reimbursed of all these modalities, would decrease by 50%. Now, what's the best management for low-risk prostate cancer? The Institute for Clinical and Economic Review tried to do an analysis. And they basically said, well, there's a lack of randomized trials between treatment modalities, and it presents a challenge of comparing acute and long-term toxicity but we probably can all agree that the overall survival, disease-free survival, and the biochemical progression-free survival are similar between IMRT, brachytherapy, and radical prostatectomy, especially in the low-risk population. So what they did was a primary cost-effective analysis based on clinical safety and effectiveness. They compared active surveillance to radical prostatectomy, to brachytherapy, to IMRT, and proton beam technology. They looked at a 65-year-old man and a 55-year-old man with clinically localized disease, and they tried to determine how quality life years could be influenced by different treatment modalities. And what we see is what we knew. Brachytherapy is actually the least expensive treatment modality. It's even less expensive than active surveillance. When it comes to quality of life, active surveillance wins out because we haven't done anything to the patient. But brachytherapy has the best quality of life compared to IMRT, proton beam, or even radical prostatectomy at less of a cost. So active surveillance to keep the same quality adjusted life year is about $1,800 more. 
for IMRT, it becomes about $35,000 more. And for proton beam therapy, it becomes about $169,000 more. So let's look at the radiation oncology process of care. So the process of care in radiation oncology is broken down basically to six uh, aspects. And if you look at all of this for IMRT, by the time we bill all the codes which we can for this course of treatment, for a 44 course treatment of IMRT, we're creating about 90 RVUs. But when you look at prostate brachytherapy, which is a single fraction, single dose, highly efficient treatment, when you're looking at the process of care, we're creating about 37 RVUs by about a third. So why is prostate brachytherapy reimbursed less than external beam radiation? Well, in the fee-for-service models, we're not rewarded for efficiency or outcomes. The more you do, the more you get paid. So you get multiple weeks of beam versus just one implant. So again, the more you do, the more you get paid. And of course, you generate more RVUs if you do things multiple times. So again, if we look at LDI brachytherapy between conventionally fractionated IMRT, we're creating 37 RVUs versus 90 RVUs, but this basically reimburses at $3,400 for LDI brachytherapy versus $27,000 for IMRT. So there's somewhat of a financial disincentive to do brachytherapy. Now, how do we define value? Now, Michael Porter at the Harvard Business School tried to define value as patient outcomes over the cost to achieve those outcomes. And the value to one patient may be different than the value to another patient. The value of one, one patient may be overall survival, disease-free survival. Maybe it's having urinary incontinence. Maybe it's having sexual function. So what we have to be pay attention to is really what does it cost to achieve those outcomes? And the, one of the ways that they postulate this can be done is by time-driven activity-based costing. And in the TDABC model, you need to determine the process of care. What activities are performed? Who performs each activity? How long does each activity take? And then you need to calculate the cost rates. So what is the cost per unit of time for each type of personnel? Doctors, nurses, physicists. You have to account for all the consumables. What is the, what is the cost of materials, devices, supplies, and drugs consumed in that cycle of care? You have, to, you have to absolutely also account for indirect costs, basically your machinery, your electricity, your physical space, your office. And individuals at UCLA did just this, and they were trying to understand the short and long-term costs of treating localized lower risk prostate cancer. They did their prostate process map for active surveillance, brachytherapy, external beam radiation therapy, and what they found is active surveillance in the short term is at least costly. But brachytherapy, especially LDI brachytherapy, was not really that much more. It was significantly less than IMRT. And robotic prostatectomy and HDR brachytherapy were someplace in the middle. What they also found though is when you look at these costs over time, things change. Active surveillance gets more expensive with time because of all the biopsies and the images which are required. And some of these patients will convert to active treatments. Prostate brachytherapy, especially low dose rate prostate brachytherapy, and even high dose rate prostate brachytherapy remain very cost effective options for treatment of prostate cancer, much more cost effective than IMRT or even radical prostatectomy. So, what is the alternative payment model? This is what's sitting radiation oncology. We've been picked to have bundles in our oncology care. Now, this started back in 2010 with the Affordable Care Act and the creation of CMMI. That's a, that's a whole lecture on itself. But basically, the alternative payment model is a shift to value-based care. They want to move away from fee-for-service, which can encourage volume, like IMRT, 44 fractions, over value, brachytherapy, one fraction. It's going to encourage efficient care and not more care. They'll also have site neutrality of payments. Right now, freestanding and hospital-based centers are reimbursed at different rates, not in this model. They'll all receive the same payment. They're hoping to simplify coding and payment. There'd be one sum of money for a course of disease-specific treatment. It also acknowledges that the OCM, the oncology care model, which is more for medical oncology, does not work for radiation oncology. But at the end of the day, it's really to reduce Medicare costs. So what sites are included? Originally it was 17, now it's down to 16, but prostate cancer is included in this bundle or in this model. What services and modalities are included? Basically, everything. 
any uh, any process of care for radiation oncology, all those services have been bundled in in all modalities of treatment. It doesn't matter how you treat a patient, you can use any of these modalities of treatment. You're going to get the same amount of money to treat that patient. But I do wanna point out that of this list of radiation oncology model, uh, model bundled codes, that CPT code 55875, transperineal needle placement into the prostate, is not bundled into the ROAPM. So a urologist who usually drops this code can still perform prostate brachytherapy with their radiation oncologist and get paid. So what about who has to participate? Well, this is actually a mandatory model. You know, it's basically random zip codes which were generated, and this is what the map looks like across the country. But if your zip code was called, you're in the model, not unlike the draft, and it's mandatory participation. You have no choice. You've got to, you've got to be in this model if you're getting um, CMS payments. This will probably encompass 40% of radiation oncology treatments delivered in this country. And this model is going to be reevaluated after five years to see how effective it really was. So how did prostate cancer do? Well, in the model and by the final rule, and again, there's still some negotiation because this model was supposed to um, happen January of 2020. Now it's going to happen in January 2022 and maybe delayed further, we'll see. However, the professional component, the payment to the physician for treating a prostate cancer patient with radiation will be $3,200. The technical component for the facility and the overhead, the equipment and all the ancillary personnel, the physicist, symmetrist, the nurses, the technicians will be $20,000. Now, as I stated previously, freestanding centers and hospital outpatient departments were paid different rates, but the APM will establish site neutral patients, uh, um, site neutral payments. There'll be no difference in payments based on location. And this is important. Regardless of the modality of treatment, the payment is the same. The physician is going to get $3,000 and the technical component is going to be $20,000 if you use protons, IMRT, SBRT, or brachytherapy. So you choose what you want to choose. Maybe you choose a more efficient model of care. So we did look at the impact of the radiation oncology payment model on brachytherapy and reimbursement. And what we found is for prostate cancer, especially in monotherapy, will benefit from increases in the payment in the RO model. Combined modality therapy, it does okay. Now uterine and cervical cancer take a big loss and this is an issue because this is going to prevent many women from potentially getting life-saving treatments. But again, focusing on prostate brachytherapy. When you're doing prostate brachytherapy in the monotherapy setting, your professional pay is probably going to increase by about $2,000 than it has been in the past. The technical, component is probably going to increase by $12,000 than it has in the past. So it kind of equalizes prostate brachytherapy and makes it financially sound to do, especially with the time and the commitment that it requires to get it done well. And the combined modality therapy is going to be about a $200 less to the professional component and about $400 left less in the technical component. And why is this? Well, the episode for this RO model is 90 days after initiation the treatment planning code. And what happens is often external beam radiation therapy and brachytherapy are going to be performed in that 90 day code. In the past we're paid separately, but now it's all gonna be included in that bundle. And that's why we see decreases in combined modality, but we see big increases in monotherapy. Now, how does this look with prostatectomies? Well, to do a prostatectomy, you're getting about $1,500 or so. But again, the urologist still can drop C the CBT code 55875 and participate in brachytherapy, which reimburses about $800, you know, a little less than half of doing a prostatectomy and probably a little bit of af less aftercare and potential complications um, by participating in this procedure. So if you ask me to follow the money and determine how patients with prostate cancer will be treated, it is possible that the ROAPM may lead to a resurgence of prostate brachytherapy by removing financial disincentives for performing the procedure. Thank you very much for your attention.